It's my great pleasure to introduce our last speaker today, uh, our neighbor from Northwestern. He's going to tell us about uh, boundary regularity under lower curvature bound. No, or oh, richer curvature. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you very much. And maybe I should open up by, by thanking the organizers both for bringing me down here and as the last speaker for, for setting up this, this, this whole conference for all of us. It's nice to see so many people out and about again. Um, so everything I'll be talking about is going to be joint work with, with Ilya and Daniele. And I should maybe mention off the bat just to interrupt me if you have questions as we're kind of going along. So my, my talk is going to be focusing on, on non-collapsed spaces with lower Ricci bounds. So just a quick little jive. Got to think manifold, got a point, lower Ricci bound, some fixed amount. Non-collapse means this. This means the volume of the ball of radius 1 is bounded from below by some definite of something. I'll give you some explanation for, for where that comes from as we're kind of moving along. And maybe also what I'll throw out there is that, you know, when I'm talking about a, a, a space here with the lower Ricci bound, I might mean one of two things in principle. Uh, I, I might mean that, that I'm talking about like some sequence of manifolds like this that have uniform lower Ricci bounds and some, some uniform non-collapsing and, and some, some gromov hausdorff limit of that. This was sort of the classical way that, that people approached trying to understand what it meant for a metric space to have a lower Ricci bound. Like nobody knew how to make sense of this, so you study limits of these things and ask what their structure was. And the more modern approach that, that happens nowadays are so-called RCD spaces. And this is essentially just a direct way of trying to find what it means for, for a metric space or a metric measure space to have a lower Ricci bound. It's really not necessary that you understand what that is. Um, if you're unhappy with it, just think manifold. Everything I'll be saying is perfectly new and interesting there. And, and I, I will, however, crash course this a little bit on RCDs, mostly because it's interesting. Um, we'll, we'll take a slide or two just to kind of understand a little bit about what it's saying. And, and as far as the, the, the conversation of this, this, this talk is concerned, um, especially when it comes to issues of regularity, it's worth pointing out that most of what will be happening here is very analogous to, to solving a nonlinear geometric PDE with some sort of finite energy bound. Right, so, so think Yang Mills or minimal surface or nonlinear harmonic maps. And what, what the role of this, this, this volume here is, what the way you should really write this is you should write this in a confusing fashion, which is to say that minus the log of this volume, maybe divided by the volume of the Euclidean space, is bound from above, is finite. Right, so that's like basically minus the log of v. So, so when you set it this way, that this lower bound on volume should really be interpreted as an upper bound on energy. Right, log of the volume is like energy. This is like saying that we have a lower Ricci bound and we have finite energy. I think I'm going to be doing this a few times. Okay, so. Our, our, our spaces here, whether we're talking about limits and manifolds or we're, we're talking about RCD space, typically, let, let me crash course you. I'm going to be mostly interested in boundary regularity of a, by the end, but, but let, let me sort of recall a little bit about the general understanding of regularity uh, of these spaces. And in particular, I'm actually going to do this twice. I'm going to do it once in a really fast way, really quick, just to, so we can sort of get an overview. And then we'll kind of re-say a lot of this more slowly in a few minutes when we work up and do notation and so forth and so on. And so like, like any good solution of a PDE, we can break it up into a regular part and a singular part. And in this case, you've got to be a little bit careful because being a lower Ricci bound, not a two-sided bound, it's more like a sub-solution to an equation. So what you mean by regular is a slightly more touchy topic. But, but nonetheless, what you get out of it is, is that the regular set has to be a topological manifold. So this much we understand so far, right? There's this, this set that's open and has a manifold structure. And going back to the work of Chigurh and Kolding, one understands that you can stratify this in the spirit of Federer. Right? So you can take the singular part and you can rip it into pieces, basically based on how singular it is, um, and study these pieces individually. And one can eventually prove that, that that's they're, 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 the dimension of the, the kth stratum of your singular set is bounded by k. Um, we'll actually define that a little more carefully later. So, so I'll leave it as a generic picture in your head for the moment. The, the, what we can say a little bit more recently, right, right, is that the, the, these kth stratums, which are supposed to be interpreted as being like the k-dimensional part of our singular sets for, 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 for our objects, they're, they're more than just k-dimensional. They are actually k-rectifiable. 
and, and that at least for at most k less than or equal to n minus 2, right? right? So you should think of the n minus 1 part is going to be the boundary. It's the top stratum of our singular set, if you want. And n minus 2 or less is going to end up being the, the, the smaller pieces of, of our, our singular set. And for, for n minus 2 or less, this, this rectifiable condition is sharp. And what that means is, you know, if you're not familiar with rectifiable, think it's a k-dimensional manifold, but you get to pull out a set of measure 0. Right, right. So, so you can lose topology and lose other things, but it will look like a, it'll have charts and look like a manifold, but 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 from 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 measurable subsets, not from open subsets. And in particular, uh, together with Nan Lee, we, we built some examples that, that basically just built examples of, of singular sets that were both k rectifiable and k Cantor sets. So these things were really nasty. There's there, there's no topology. Um, there's no real hope for this. That, that, that that's going to happen for for these stratums. Um, but, but the question was sort of left over. Our examples didn't do anything for the top stratum, namely, namely the n minus 1 part uh, of the singular set. And what Danielle and Eli I wanted to ask was, was if one can do more. Um, so, so what we'll eventually see by the end of the talk right, is that it's not just going to have a nice little n minus 1 rectifiable structure, although it does have that. Uh, it'll also be a manifold, at least away from a co-dimension 2 set. So, so you can actually produce better and actual topological structures on these pieces. And because of that, uh, uh, limits then have to be manifolds, possibly with boundary away from co-dimension two sets in the end. Actually, these co-dimension two sets we'll see can actually be taken to be fairly nice. They, they, they themselves have to have finite measure and be rectifiable. And this is sort of a, a relatively new point as well. OK, outline of talk. Um, so so that, that, that was the crash course. And I'll do most everything I just said. Like The entire talk will be redoing, but very slowly. Um, so, so I'm going to do a little bit of background on the Ricci tensor as an excuse both to introduce some notation and just to give you a little bit of intuition of where this thing comes from. Um, I'll talk a little bit uh, about Ricci curvature and metric measure spaces in general, once again, just to kind of give us, especially if we're not familiar, uh, a little bit of connection on how these things actually interact with analysis and one has hope of actually controlling and understanding these spaces. Uh, we'll talk about the main theorems. And what I'll do actually for, for in terms of the proof is maybe two things. I, what I am most interested in is that I, I want to compare the proof of what's going to happen here to the, the, this topological structure for the boundary uh, to, to the topological structure for, for, for the regular set. There, there's a very classical way of proving topological structures for, for regular sets because these things are basically small energy, right? right? Not just bounded energy, but small energy. And you can't play that game on the boundary. So, so really, where, where, where the topological structure has to come from is something different. And so we'll, we'll even outline quickly the, 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 the proof of the epsilon regularity for regular sets and then talk about how to compare that to uh, the boundary case. OK. Also, I should maybe add, I have no idea how long this talk will take. So, so either I'll finish early or after my time, I'll just be done at some point, and we'll see what happens. OK, background. M. We want a manifold. Um, X will usually represent for me a metric space of some sort. D, the distance. Uh, nu there can be a measure. That's usually so metric measure space, right? The standard notation I'll use throughout the talk. Um, Riemannian curvature tensor. So, so very roughly speaking, what is this silly thing, right? If I'm on Euclidean space, it is a four tensor, right? That means I take three vector fields, x, y, z, I get a new vector field out of it, right? If I am on Euclidean space, then, then you have this property, right? You've got this property that if I take a vector field z and if I look at its Hessian, it doesn't matter if I take the xy derivative or the yx derivative, you get the same thing. It doesn't matter what order you take derivatives in, they're the same. This is simply not true on a manifold. Um, so what you do is you look at the difference because, well, Riemann had this, this really outstanding observation that, well, you know, that may not be zero, but it doesn't depend on derivatives of z. Um, this actually ends up being a tensor in z, right? It only depends on the value of z at that point, not, not any derivatives of z. So, so we call this thing the curvature. And although one does compute with that formula all the time, it's highly unintuitive. This is, doesn't tell you why curvature is interesting or, or actually important. And, and the way you should interpret the, 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 the curvature here is, is the Hessian of the Riemannian metric, right? The Riemannian metric is a two tensor. That means its Hessian should be a four tensor, one derivative, another derivative. So we go up by two. The actual Hessian is zero, basically, I mean, by definition of, of what the derivative is on this thing, right? But the curvature should be understood as the right replacement for the Hessian of the metric. And that way, when you say it this way, uh, it becomes almost intuitive that if you have a Riemannian manifold with bounded curvature, you should expect it to geometrically behave like a function on Rn with C2 bounds, right? It shouldn't be that awful. There should be some notion of control. 
and basically modulo diffeomorphisms, which means taking good coordinates, that's exactly what happens. The Ricci curvature is the trace uh, of the, the, the Riemann curvature tensor. So you pick some orthonormal basis, stick it into the slots, and sum it up. And, and now if we're going to interpret the Riemann curvature operator as the Hessian of the metric, that means we're going to interpret the Ricci curvature as the Laplacian of the metric. And suddenly it's not shocking why the Ricci curvature should appear everywhere when we're doing analysis on a manifold. It's the same reason why Laplacians appear everywhere when we're doing analysis on anything. Uh, they, they just have a way of appearing when, when, when you're going through stuff. Um, <clears throat> And, and maybe where we'll start from here is to try to get a little bit of a feel for, for Ricci curvature that, that, that's other than this. So, so we see this sort of being a nonlinear Laplacian in the same way that, that Yang Mills is a nonlinear Laplace equation, and nonlinear harmonic maps is by definition a nonlinear harmonic Laplace equation. Uh, but it turns out that that lower Ricci curvature ha has some, some, some extra sort of ingredients to it that turns out to be uh, um, relatively useful, namely, there are, at this point, there's almost a, a, a small workhouse business of people producing ways of understanding when a space has a lower bound than the Ricci curvature that never involves computing Ricci curvature, right? right? So, so there, there, there are actually many ways of doing this, and, and this has a lot of advantages, right? right? So one advantage is that every time I tell you a way of understanding is when a space has a lower bound on Ricci curvature that doesn't involve computing it, essentially, there's an estimate or an idea that you've connected Ricci curvature to. Right, there, there's something being controlled in, in a way that, 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 that's so sharp that if I understand that object, I understand Ricci curvature. And from, from an even broader point of view, this is how people make sense of, of, of lower Ricci bounds on metric measure spaces. If I can write down for you a way of understanding when a space has a lower Ricci bound that involves computing things that I can compute on a metric measure space, well, I can ask if that space has this property. Right? And that's more or less all that happens. I mean, that's what an RCD space in the end is. is it's taking some of these ways of understanding uh, lower Ricci without computing lower Ricci. So what I am going to do here is, is, is I'm going to work one easy example for you um, of how to do this. In fact, this is a terrible way to define lower bounds on a Ricci curvature, but it does work. Um, there, there are much more refined ways of doing this. This is also an excuse for me to uh, get some notation kind of shoved in your head that we'll be using. So, so the example is this. Take Rn, just, just Euclidean space, take some, some compactly supported function on it with, with some gradient bound, which I'm going to call 1 because why not? And let me float by the heat flow. So, so let u sub t solve the heat flow. So, so ddt minus the Laplacian of u sub t equals zero. So a, capital H sub t here will be my, my, my heat flow operator as we're going through. And it's a nice and perfectly well-known property that we have something called heat kernels, right? So, so if I want to understand well, what the value of, uh, of the, the, the solution of the heat flow is at some time t and at some point x, there's a measure. And this measure turns out to be the Gaussian measure. That I, compare my initial con that I compare with my initial condition, if I integrate, the value I get is exactly that. It's the value of u at time t at the point x. And we can use this to compute a nice little quantity. So if I want to compute now what the gradient uh, uh, of u is after I float by the heat flow, then let's just do some silly computations. Right? If I take the gradient of u, then that gradient moves in and hits the, hits the heat kernel, because this is an x gradient, hitting the x gradient. Since the heat kernel for Euclidean space is a function of x minus y, I can just call that the y derivative. It doesn't actually matter which I do. I can integrate by parts and shove it onto u again. And I can just do a silly um, inequality to, 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 to make this the less than or equal to the integral of the norm of the gradient of u times the heat kernel. And now two observations. Right? This was assumed to be one point wise, and this is a probability measure. And if I put those together, you get that after I flow this by the heat flow, the gradient is still bounded by 1. Right, right? It's not bounded, right? which certainly it's bounded, but it's better than bounded. It's bounded by exactly the bound we started with. Right? Gradient bounds are preserved under the heat flow on Euclidean space. And it becomes a perfectly reasonable question to ask, you know, does this you know, ever actually happen on a manifold? Right? I mean, if we're on a random manifold and if I flow something by the heat flow, when are gradient bounds actually preserved? And it turns out they're preserved if and only if the Ricci curvature is non-negative on our space. Right? So, so in this way, we, we understand, and what's actually a really bad way, there's much better ways of saying this, but we understand in some way how a lower bound on Ricci curvature is equivalent to understanding some analysis on that manifold. Right? We are able to control gradients of, of, of heat flows. That means gradients of harmonic functions. There's some connection here between pain analysis and geometry going on. 
Uh, by the way, note that we actually proved up here a much better estimate. We, we proved that, that there's a point-wise version of this that says that the heat flow operator and the gradient almost commutes. They commute up to sine. Right? I can flow and then take the norm of the gradient, or I can take the norm of the gradient and then flow, and up to sine they'll commute. Right? And th 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 this is, is a, at least a much better version of that. And actually, there's a whole class of estimates that look a lot like this uh, due to Bakri, Emery, and Ladeau that, that, that you can write down all of which will be equivalent to lower bounds on Ricci curvature. You can get other lower bounds besides zero. You add some ugly exponentials into all of this, but, but it looks much the same. So the end moral is that you have a lower Ricci bound if and only if you have analysis on M, right? right, right. The, 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 these, these two notions are in a very precise way equivalent. And although I'm not gonna use it in the slightest in this talk since, since, since I'm sort of at the end here and I can throw it in, um, it turns out there's actually equivalences for two set at Ricci bounds as well that, 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 that exist. And they look almost exactly the same. It says that bounded Ricci on M is, a, is, is equivalent if and only if you have analysis on the path space of the manifold. Uh, essentially, you're going to replace um, heat flows, which is what's happening up here for, for manifolds with martingales. This is the right replacement on the path space. And controlling gradients of functions under martingales will be equivalent to being Ricci flat in, in much the same way you have this being written here. That has, however, nothing to do with the rest of our talk. Okay, so, so fine, that, that was our sort of one concrete example, and now, now I'll give you a whole bunch of non-concrete examples and just sort of words. So we have a lot of other interpretations as well. The one I was just talking about before, one example of it anyway, was, was a purely analytic way. So it was a way of understanding when we have a lower Ricci bound based on analysis, based on estimates, on, 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 on solutions of things. There are other ways of doing this that are a little bit more geometrically flavored, in particular, the, uh, particularly popular. One is, is optimal transport. And just to sort of tell you what, what this says, let's do the following. Let's just take a manifold. Let's look at the, the space of probability measures on it, right? which I'm going to write as being absolutely continuous with respect to the Riemannian volume measure on my space. And we're going to equip this with a geometry called the Wasserstein geometry. Basically, don't worry if you don't know what it is. There's a geometry that's natural. You stick it on this thing. And on top of a natural geometry, you can stick on the space of probability but measures. There, there, there's a function you can put on it, the entropy functional, right? You integrate not, so the integral of rho should be one. This is a probability measure. The integral of log rho rho is the so-called entropy of your guy. And there's a really nice result out there that says that the entropy is convex if and only if you have non-negative Ricci curvature, right? And this is actually the, the, the popular starting point for metric measure space definitions of, of lower Ricci bounds. So if I talk about an RCD space, it's going to mean this in the end, basically, a space that satisfies this condition. Um, I, I should mention that really the architects of all that were Sturm, Lott, Volani, Ambrosio, Gilles, Savier. The, the, the last three are the ones who sort of made all the, 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 the analytics precise enough to make this doable. And also, I should point out that as you know, weird looking as that might be, if you're not used to it, this is a perfectly checkable thing on a metric measure space. Like, like this is a perfectly reasonable thing to write down and just ask about. All these notions, including the Wasserstein distance, it have very weak formulations that that makes sense anywhere. Like, you don't need any real structure to, to, to ask this question. And the last sort of crash course I'm gonna uh, I'll give on these sort of lower bounds. By the way, how am I doing? Me. Um, is that a little observation from the last thing. Nothing I wrote down, if I'm doing this on a, on a metric measure space, where did dimension come from in all this? Like I, I wrote down for you, you a, a way of defining a lower Ricci bound in a couple different ways, an analytic way and, and, and a way in terms of the entropy. But if I do that on a metric space, I don't know what the dimension is anymore. And we know perfectly well the dimension of the space should be important in all of this. Like, like if you don't have a bound on the dimension, you, you shouldn't expect as nice results as if you do. Um, so it turns out there are better ways uh, of actually writing all this. So this, this, this nice little semi uh, uh, um, commuting property of the heat flow and the gradient has an improvement. Turns out you can stick a Laplacian uh, of your solution in there as well. And this, this brings dimension into it. And it turns out that's equivalent to not just being, being um, having non-negative Ricci curvature, but if you're on an n-dimensional manifold, it's basically equivalent to having a, a, a um, uh, being dimension in and having a lower Ricci, Ricci bound. And likewise, we can define refinements of the entropy. Then instead of log, we can just look at some power of the, the, the row instead. And, and then we'll have a notion of n-dimensional Ricci curvature. And the definition of a metric measure space 
uh, having n-dimensional Ricci curvature bounded from below is, well, one of them, actually there's about 16, but one of them is exactly that, asking that this functional here be v-convex on the space of probability measures. And the last point, that's a subtlety, all of which you can think manifold. This is just a crash course, interesting stuff. It is then when people use the term R in front of it, so you can do all this in quite generality. No one says the Laplacian that you get out of this, which you can't make sense on a metric measure space. You can make sense of a Laplacian, but no one says it's linear. It turns out not necessarily to be linear for free. And if you assume it's linear, you call it a, a Riemannian CD space. So, so a, this is what people mean by an RCD space. The, and this is really going to be the, 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 the right replacement for limits of smooth manifolds um, in a few minutes. So for instance, if I take a sequence of manifolds and they're n-dimensional and, and they have lower bounds on the Ricci curvature and I take some gromov hausdorff limit, what I get in that limit would have to be one of these RCDK in spaces, right? right? So, so in particular, it falls inside this class, but it might be bigger. People don't have a very good understanding of how often they have to be limits of, of, of higher dimensional spaces. And a point I'll actually maybe mention here real quick that's not at all obvious, by the way. This is a real theorem. Um, is that if we have the non-collapsing condition, which had nothing to do with any of our definitions here real quick. So when you take a limit here, you don't just limit out the, 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 the metric space, you also limit out the measure. Now this measure limits out to some measure mu, and if you have the lower volume bound, that, that measure mu turns out to be just the Hausdorff measure on the limit space. Right? So non-collapsed for RCD spaces means that we don't really have a measure either. We actually just have the Hausdorff measure on the space. So when I talk about an RCD space, which is non-collapsed, it just means I've got a metric measure space. It's got a lower Ricci bound, and I'm talking about the Hausdorff measure on it. Or I'm talking about smooth Riemannian manifold, whichever you prefer. OK. So enough of our RCD nonsense. OK, so what I want to do now is, is, is I, I want to work my way up to the boundary case. But again, I want to start repeating some of the background uh, about um, the, the, the structure of spaces with lower Ricci bounds that are non-collapsed in slight more generality here, like, like, like sort of what's known about the, the singular and regular sets in, in general. And, and the first real progress by this, well, actually, in fairness, the first real progress was Gromov, who told us that limits even exist and we can do all this. Um, after that, in terms of you know, knowing that there's actually a metric space limit, knowing what that thing looks like, the first major progress was, 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 by, was by Jigger and Kohling. And, and what they were able to do was introduce the stratification in, in, into the, 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 the Ricci curvature context. Um, it's worth pointing out that you know, these, these stratifications, they, they, they appear in all these geometric equations that, that, that kind of come up, right? So Yang-Mills or harmonic maps and minimal surfaces. And they're all based on sort of monotone quantities um, in, in the end. So in, in the Ricci case, right, right, there, there, there was an extra challenge kind of floating around here. So, so you know, morally speaking, I, I think it was probably understood for a little bit that there should be a stratification for, for, for spaces with lower Ricci bounds. But, but a, a, re, really, you know, their, their, their most important contribution in all this is that if you're looking at something like a minimal surface and you're looking at the area functional, and this, this defines a monotone quantity, well, when this monotone quantity is a constant, you gain symmetries, right? This, this is how this game gets played when you're talking about stratification, is that these monotone quantities force symmetries. And while that might be morally kind of understandable in the Ricci context, actually proving that turned out to be a beast, right? right? It's like five lines in most of these other equations. But in this context, one had to actually produce a whole way of actually doing analysis that didn't exist in order to produce this. Like you couldn't just just sort of you know do a formal computation and see it see it was correct. So what's stratification now? Okay, so so the stratification in general is about understanding the actual symmetries of, of your your solution infinitesimally, right? And if I want to explain that, I have to explain two words to you. I have to explain what a symmetry is, and I have to explain what infinitesimally is. Right, so, so a symmetry is the following. We say a metric space in general is k-symmetric if it's simply rk cross a cone, um, or where, where c is the metric cone. I could give you a precise definition of metric cone in the metric context, but it wouldn't help. Just think cone. There's a precise definition of that, right? 
And for infinitesimal, what I mean is a tangent cone. And, and so, so the definition of a tangent cone here is the following. Take a metric space, take a point y, and I want to start zooming up at y. So I'm going to take some, some radii, r sub i, and they're going to be tending towards zero, right? And so, so I'm going to be zooming up more and more about the space, and I'm going to be taking these balls, and I'm going to be blowing up to, to be balls of radius 1 by rescaling, right? So this is what my, my rescaling over here is doing. It's taking a ball of radius ri and making it a ball of radius 1. So I'm basically taking a microscope at some point and zooming in closer and closer, pulling it out. And if I take some limits of doing that, right, any limit I get out of that, I call a tangent cone. Right? It's what's describing, describing the infinitesimal behavior uh, of my solution at a point. And so the definition of the stratification is that in your metric space X, you're looking at the set of points X where no tangent cone is K plus 1 symmetric. Okay. So, so this is defined in a somewhat confusing double negative way that was actually brilliant. This, this was really Federer who, who understood how to say things in the way to make the measure theory work for this. So the way you want to interpret um, SK, right? It's supposed to be like the k-dimensional part of the singular set. It's, you kind of want to view it, maybe up to something smaller, as being the set of points where you have k-symmetries. So you blow up and suddenly you look like RK across something, because that's kind of what happens on k-stratums of things when, when you start decomposing in stratifications. Uh, the way it gets phrased instead is that you're looking at the, the, the set of points where you don't have k plus 1 degrees of symmetry. And to be very careful about this, there were no tangent cone is used because tangent cones don't have to be unique. Right, right. So, so you, you can have all kinds of tangent cones there, and you're insisting that none of them actually have a lot of symmetry when you're floating around this. But it does turn out that, that since uh, by Gromov's result, tangent cones will actually exist when you look at this. And what Cheeger and Kohling showed was that a tangent cone is a metric cone. So, so if I take a limit like this, where I am zooming up more and more at some point, blowing up and seeing what I get, I'm not just arriving at some other random metric space if I'm talking about a limit of space of lower Ricci bounds, because if I was, what was the point? Like, like, what was worth the trouble of actually zooming up at that point? I've gained something. And what I've gained is that it's an actual metric cone at that point. If you want, it's zero symmetric. I've gained some amount of symmetry when I've blown up on this. And once you understand that tangent cones are metric cones, you, you can sort of throw in the machinery of Federer and find out that actually the, the dimension of SK is less than or equal to K. So that this, this, this sort of belief that this should be the K-dimensional part of the singular, singular set becomes true at this stage. I'll do an example in a minute so we can see how this all breaks up for an example. And in particular, maybe the, 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 the big result that really came out of this for, for, for them is the following. So let, let, let's imagine that we've got a sequence of manifolds for the moment. They've got lower Ricci bounds. They've got lower volume bounds, so they're non-collapsed. And they're also boundary free. Let me not worry about that. Right? Then the limit you get has to be boundary free as well. And what you get is something that's homeomorphic away from a codimension 2 set. Right? So they're able to say that no boundary goes to no boundary in all of this. Um, we'll have a new proof at this point, actually, because their, their, their argument is, is um, very clever and very not analytic. Right, right, right. Well, well, it's, a, it's argued in a very roundabout way, and, and we'll give a much more analysis proof of this point um, as a consequence of the stuff that'll kind of come. There's no clock in this room, so I'm getting one. Say this again. Here? Um, no, the epsilon regularity is because it's homeomorphic to a manifold. So this I'm saying there's no boundary. This is n minus 1. And then I'm saying that what's left over after that has to be a manifold. And that's coming, I didn't say what the epsilon regularity was, of course. That's coming from the fact that once you look close to, to Rn, you've got to be topologically Rn. This, this, the fact that the regular set has to be. Yeah, yeah. So, so they, 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 they prove the, the, the sort of the, the, the classical looking epsilon regularity in this context where, where top stratum regular sets have to actually have topological manifold structures. I'll state that more precisely later, and I'm just throwing it in there for now. OK, uh, let's do an example real quick, just sort of see how this works. Real easy example. Um, in fact, easiest I can kind of get away and still call it an example. Just so we can see where, where all the co-dimension 2 business and stuff like that kind of comes from and all this. So let's take an ice cream cone. So, so 
I've got here a metric cone over a circle. Circles of radius r. If r, by the way, is 1, then what you necessarily have is r2 out of this. This, this is a nice, so if that circle spreads out too much, so as r gets bigger, right, this cone will kind of open up. And if r becomes a circle of radius 1, you'll actually have r2 coming out. It'll be completely flat. And if r is less than 1, you kind of have your little cone point that, 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 that's appearing out of this. You get an ice cream cone. And the example is simply the following. Take this bottom here and smooth it out. And now just do it less and less. Right? So here's our metric cone. Smooth it out here, smooth it out here, smooth it out here. What's happening here, curvature is clearly going to infinity when I do this. Right, but this is very convex, right, right? So, you know, even if we don't have a great feel for curvature, we can kind of believe that's positive curvature right there, that convexity. So curvature is going to infinity, but only in a plus way. So these have lower bounds on Ricci curvature, in fact, lower bounds on sectional curvature. And what they'll limit to is just the straight up ice cream cone. If we think about it for a minute, what's an ice cream cone? It has a single singularity point, right? So topologically, this guy is R2. It has a single singular point, that's co-dimension two, right? That's one point in a two-dimensional space. Right? And then that's essentially what, what their regular set kind of controls and proves. Good exercise here. If I looked at the tangent cones instead of my metric cone here, I got two examples that will happen. If I pick a point here, and if I look at the metric cone at some, some point that's not the cone point here, then what happens when I blow up at this point and zoom up more and more and more? I mean, well, I'm going to get R in because it's a manifold. Right, manifolds, when you blow up on them, they look like Rn, in fact, in much better ways than you're asking for for, for, for tangent cones in this context. So when I go zooming up at this point, I'm simply going to get a Rn out of this. So, so I'm going to get either a Rn if x is not the origin. And if I pick the origin, here's a good exercise to think about. So what happens if I take this ball of radius r right here and I rescale it to a ball of radius 1? What happens to my metric space when I'm zooming up at this point? And the answer is absolutely nothing. In fact, this, this is almost you know, what a cone is. If I take a ball here around this point and I rescale this up, I just get exactly the same thing again. So in particular, my, my, my tangent cone at that point is simply, simply going to be, um, it is simply going to be x itself. And then I think in the example up here, all I really did was I turned my two-dimensional example into an n-dimensional example by stupidly crossing it by r minus 2. Because now you can see that the, the singular set of this thing. So, so x itself is n minus 2 symmetric, but it is not n minus 1 symmetric. Right, right? So, so the, the, this, is, the, this space has a lot of symmetry, but not too much symmetry in what we're studying. And the singular set is exactly the n minus 2 part of the singular set, which is exactly just this n minus 2 plane, which here is just a point, because all I've got is a point. Yeah? Whenever, whenever r is less than 1. When r is equal to 1, exactly, this will just be rn, exactly. No, I mean, there's a singular, if that, if that, if that singular set, if that r is anything less than 1, right, you've got a singular set at this point, right? So the singular set can be dense, right? But so, so that, I, so, okay. I didn't define what the regular set was, to be very clear. I was very careful not to do that. Because what's happening here is that the singular set can be dense. The quantitative singular set won't be. So what will happen is, is that you can, you can group a lot of the singular points. So like if r is very close to 1 here, that won't be in the epsilon in minus 2 singular set. And you can group that together, and that will have the manifold structure. All right? So Richard's pointing out all the things I'm hiding under the, under the rug for, for, for everybody. <laughs> oh, and just to throw it out there, right? So, so one can build a bunch of and these tangent cones. I mean, they're not unique, and you can do a bunch of crazy stuff with them. So you can get examples of limit spaces, such that the tangent cones are unique. And for instance, for every k, you could have that, that the tangent cone is exactly k-symmetric. So even the amount of symmetry you have is not well-defined. Right? It's extremely important that you're saying no tangent cone has such and such a symmetry. And you can actually build tangent cones that aren't even homeomorphic to one another. Right? So, so, I mean, nuts way things happen. So if I take different limits going down here, right, your, your different limits may not be homeomorphic. All kinds of nonsense can happen. Okay.
Okay, so, so, and then the last point before we really get to boundary here that I, that I sort of maybe want to mention is that, so in all the examples we were sort of writing down before and all the ones you might picture and basically whenever you use the word stratification, think about it, you know, there, there's this notion of a stratification which was defined very precisely and it was proved that the dimension of this thing was less than or equal to k and that this is, this is really nice. But certainly when we look at the examples from before where these things were just literally planes and really an example you can kind of think of, one expects more structure from this, right? I mean, certainly all those things look like they're manifolds. Um, so they don't just look like they're k-dimensional spaces, they look like they're k-dimensional manifolds coming out of this. And that turns out to be a little bit too much to ask. Um, but so for instance, as a silly example, you could have an example like this. So like your, your, your one singular set is basically a manifold away from that point right there, right? So that's a little bit too much to ask, and there's actually slightly nastier things you can do with this as well. But what, what you can prove is you can prove that they're going to be rectifiable. Rectifiable, once again, is basically like a manifold away from a set of measure zero uh, in your space. So, so it'll be actually covered by charts in the end. Sorry, I'm trying to find my notes. I'm all kinds of lost. Okay. Um, so it, it's sort of historically speaking, maybe worth mentioning, right? So Federer proved this, this, this dimension estimate in the 60s. And really, when it came to more structure than that, nothing new was really known to the 90s when, when, when Leon Simon came into the field and, and had this really outstanding collection of ideas. Um, where he was able to prove that the top stratums uh, of singular sets in various contexts actually had this, this, this rectifiable structure. Um, and then, so, so what this here is saying is that all the, the, the stratums actually have to be rectifiable out of this. It's probably maybe worth pointing out a couple of things. So this is not really the, the, the focus of the talk here, but um, so, so there, there, there's uh, a handful of ideas that kind of go into this. And maybe one thing that's worth mentioning um, is that you know, you're not really studying the singular set here. You're studying something called the quantitative singular set. So, so that is, if you have any, these things can be dense, as it turns out. So if you have any hope of proving manifold-like structure, this can be like a countable union of manifolds here. And if you have any hope of proving structure on this sort of thing, um, then you've gonna, you're going to sort of want to start by breaking it up into pieces that you hope are better behaved. And it turns out that you can separate points instead of infinitesimal symmetries, uh, exact infinitesimal symmetries, you can break a point um, points based on almost symmetries of balls of definite radius. And this is what the quantitative stratification does. It turns out all the useful applications are from this anyway. This is how you get a priori estimates on things. Um, and uh, the original sort of proofs uh, of these sort of rectifiable structures was with Daniel Evo Torta for nonlinear harmonic maps. Um, but it's worth pointing out that argument doesn't work in, in the Ricci context. The, the, the bending of the geometry adds fundamental layers that, that are quite different. And, and I bring this up in particular, oh, darn, um, in reference to, to a comment Otis made uh, about the parabolic case. So the parabolic case is still open uh, for proving these sort of rectifiable structures. And I think the reason is very, very similar to, to what happens in, in this sort of uh, um, Einstein or lower Ricci context. So there's too much interaction of, of other terms going on. To get around these issues, one ends up, instead of trying to build the rectifiable structure, the, the, these charts by hand, you solve equations to do it. And I think probably a good starting point for these parabolic equations is to do something similar. I, I highly encourage someone to work on that problem. Okay. And so this, this rectifiable structure is sharp, at least for, for k less than or equal to m minus 2, and the, 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 because the singular set can be cantor. Right? So it turns out you can take this guy here, and I can basically restrict to any closed subset I want. Pick your favorite. And I can give you an example of a singular set that's that closed subset. So it'll all be contained in the line. It'll be rectifiable. It's like contained in a manifold. But it itself is like some completely random looking closed subset of that manifold. In particular, there's no topological structure. And just as a sort of a last sort of point to make about, about the, the, the structure of spaces until we move to boundary, is that uh, so now if we look at limits of spaces that, that have lower Ricci bounds and have lower volume bounds, then the limit isn't just uh, a manifold if you assume these are boundary free. Then the limit's not just a manifold away from a co dimension two set, it's actually going to end up being a manifold away from an m minus 2 rectifiable set. So basically an m minus 2 manifold set with finite measure. Um, and the tangent cones of the space will be unique away from an m minus 2 measure 0 set, conjecturally m minus 3 set. <laughs>
Okay. So enough on that. Um, something new. And I'm clearly not getting anywhere near proofs today. Um, so this, this sort of rectifiable structure, this kind of almost manifold structure on the singular set is sharp for, for the lower stratum. When you go below the n minus 2 stage of this, like you, you can build these sort of nasty looking things. Um, but you know, the, the question becomes, what about the, the, the top stratum of this thing? So the n minus 1 stratum of this thing, when, when this thing might have boundary. The notion of boundary, by the way, is a little subtle. And I'm, I'm using it interchangeably with, with, with this, this top stratum of the singular set. This is going to be true. Um, but this is only kind of true after the fact when these, these, these theorems get proved. They're actually defined differently, but they, they end up being the same thing. Um, so what I'm going to talk about here are going to be, be again, non-collapsed spaces with, 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 with uh, lower Ricci bounds. So take limits of manifolds if you want. That, 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 that's fine. And one can certainly show that this top stratum is n minus 1 rectifiable. This, this basically follows already. In fact, it's a lot easier for that top stratum. Um, to, to prove rectifiable for, for, for the, the, the boundary structure. Um, but since these examples with, with, with Lee don't work, we want to ask if there's topological structure on this. And uh, the, the main result here is going to be the following. So let's take a RCD space. So, so if you want a limit of manifolds with lower Ricci bounds, which are n-dimensional. Then its boundary is going to be, well, it's n minus 1 rectifiable, but, but away from a codimension 2 subset, so actually, once again, a finite measure codimension 2 subset, we're going to have that it's homeomorphic to a manifold. And actually, interestingly enough, okay, I should have broken this up into like several stages so there's not so much to read at once. Um, there's a notion of volume convergence here going on. So, so a, a relatively famous result is, is this Colding volume convergence. And it says that if I have a sequence of, of non-collapsed spaces, and if I, if I take the, 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 the limit of them, then volumes of things have to converge when, when we actually move out there. It turns out the same thing happens on the boundary. So, so if I take a sequence of spaces, with possibly with boundary, and if I look at the boundary as itself a metric space, I'm just looking at the boundary, I'm throwing away the rest of the structure, I'm looking at the distance function on this thing, and I'm restricting it to the n minus 1 Hausdorff measure. Right? So a priori, you don't know this has anything to do with the measure you started with on your original space. Then it turns out that that boundary will converge to the boundary in the gromov hausdorff sense, and the measure on the boundary will converge to the measure in the limits. And in particular, this, this is telling you that, that in a very strong way, if you have empty boundary, you have to limit to empty boundary. If you have non-empty boundary in the limit, then you have to have non-empty boundary that's kind of converging to it. In fact, measure in a measure sense, like it's the same amount that actually has to be in your spaces pre-limit. Uh, the manifold version would be just look at, drop the boundary, right? Drop the boundary. That's it, right? So, so if, if I Gromov Hausdorff converge these metric spaces with the n minus with the, the, the n-dimensional Hausdorff measure, the volume measure limit of this will be the n-dimensional Hausdorff measure. In that case. Oh yeah, yeah. So, so if if these xi's were just manifolds, you're talking about this top stratum or the boundary case? I, I got lost. No, boundaries converge. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's the, 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 the theorem is that the boundaries will have to converge, and they'll actually have to converge in a measure sense. Measures will be preserved on them. OK. So I think, OK. So all of this boils down to the following result. Um, that this is sort of the, 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 the main technical result that one wants to prove by the end. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll state the two kind of main technical results, and then I'm just going to say in words what happens in the proof, and you know, we, we, we can get in the picture and leave it at that. Um, so let's again, let's take a space, right? Let, let's assume it, it's non-collapsed. So, so it's a manifold. It's got the Hausdorff measure on. It's got a lower Ricci bound. I'm assuming the lower Ricci bound here is small. That doesn't mean anything. That basically means if it's not small, look at a small ball and we blow it up. It just means this theorem applies to small balls inside this, but uniformly small balls inside this guy. Let's assume that, that, that the ball you're staring at, the ball of radius 2, let's, let's draw a picture of this because there's just way too many words there. 
So we're staring at some ball in our metric space, We've got a lower Ricci bound. We're assuming that this ball is actually Grom of Hausdorff close to a half space, right? So in a very rough, ugly looking way that doesn't see below like that top scale, right? In an epsilon kind of way, it's looking close to like a half space on this ball. Uh, then in fact, it's got to be homeomorphic to a half space. Right, so, so if on the top scale it just looks like a half space in a very, very sloppy Grom of Hausdorff way, then you've actually got to be homeomorphic to, 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 to a half space. So th this is where the topological structure comes from. That way all you have to do in all this is produce points or understand when there are points that look close to a half space and automatically you, you, you have boundary that has to come from this. So if you have anything inside that top stratum of the singular set, the top stratum of the singular set, the s in minus 1 should have points that are in minus 1 symmetric. And minus 1 symmetric points are going to be half spaces. That's all they can be. It means every point of that actually has to be, have a homeomorphic piece of it near, near, nearby. Um, and this, actually, the whole setup really just gives an analytic proof for the fact that, that if you're looking at manifold limits without boundary, then the limit can't have boundary. I mentioned that for the last thing anyway. It follows directly from that. OK. Wait a minute. Time for me to look at the time and figure out if there's any reality to this. No. So here's what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to say in 20 words what has to happen here. Purely in words, this is being recorded. That way, somebody who actually reads the paper can listen to words 16 times while they're trying to get a sense for well, what, what, what's actually happening in here. So, so you know, the classical epsilon regularity theorem says something very similar. Right? It says that if I take a ball, but if it's Grom of Hausdorff close to, say, a, a ball in Rn, not a half space, but the whole space, then we get that the ball has to be homeomorphic to a ball in Rn. And roughly speaking, how does this proof work? Right? So I've got some ball here. And it's close to a half space. So there's, a, there's like four steps to the proof of understanding the homeomorphic structure in the classical sense. Now the steps are, well, the moment you're close to this guy, then volume convergence tells you that the volume of this ball is almost equal to the, the, the volume of the ball of radius 1 in Euclidean space. Volume ratios are monotone here. So this immediately implies that every ball of radius r here at every point inside here must actually be close to the volume of ball of radius r in Euclidean space. This here re implies that. This actually implies that the ball of radius r is almost close to around this point x, is close to a ball of radius r in Euclidean space. And now what that's told you is that starting from just the condition on the top scale, we have that every ball looks close to a ball in Euclidean space, and there's a Reifenberg theorem out there. And Reifenberg says that if you have a space, and if it always looks close to Euclidean on all scales and at all points, it has to be homeomorphic to a ball. You have no other choice. OK. Now, in the context of the, the, the boundary regularity, this, this all falls apart. Because if I'm close to, to a, a ball of radius 1 and a half space, that will tell me that our ball of radius 1 in that context is close to this. And certainly, I get a lower bound of this here, but it doesn't have to be equal to this everywhere. There are a lot of spaces that have volume close to this, besides just a half space. So there's no rigidity coming from, from the half space anymore. So what you're going to do is you're going to take a ball like this that looks close to it, and you're going to cover in a very precise way called the boundary neck region. Basically, you're going to keep going down as far as you can until this thing stops looking like a boundary. Right? You don't know when that is. It'll stop at some point. And what you're going to end up proving here is that, well, whenever it's close to looking like a boundary, there's going to be two major statements you want. One is that, well, as long as it keeps looking close to like a boundary, there actually have to be some boundary points. So there at least has to be. You know, 10 points in here that are legitimate, legitimate boundary points sitting inside this. And when you have this, what you can use that for is if I'm down in here staring at some small ball, what I want to show is that this, these smallest balls where this thing stops looking like a boundary have to have radius zero. Like it doesn't really exist. In fact, I can keep going down forever and it looks like a half space. 
So imagine that it actually stopped existing at some point. So down on this small scale, I'll have some boundary points here. And by my monotone quantity now, I'll know that I'm extremely cone-like at all of them. And that's actually gonna force this ball to look even closer to, to a, a um, half space than I thought it did, which means I couldn't have actually stopped. And that means I can go down all the way to the bottom, right? right? So, so that was unbelievably fast, but, but I'm gonna take it at that and be done. Thank you. It's a surprise. Um, any questions? With them? What's up? Say this. Same thing, right? Take a manifold. Maybe it has a manifold with boundary. Assume it has a lower reach bound. Now be careful now that that, that says something. I mean, that, that's, that's a condition on the analysis, right? If you're close, yeah, but you don't even need to. Even for the manifold, it's a new statement. It's saying that if you look close to a half space on that manifold, then actually your manifold has to be a half space. Right? So even for a manifold, it's, it's a perfectly new statement. Because just because you look close to that guy doesn't mean, I mean, you didn't know a priori that it actually has to down at lower scales. So this top scale thing forces topology all the way at the bottom. That won't have non-negative Ricci curvature. Non-negative Ricci curvature is, is in an RCD or in this analysis case. Oh, I think it's fairly strong. It's, it's, it's like um, um, non-negative second fundamental form, I think, if you, if you use that directly. Is that it? Yes, it is locally finite. That's a good question, in fact. Otherwise, it's not very helpful. So it's not just locally finite, but on this ball here where you look close to a half space, the volume of that will be close to the volume of a ball of radius 1 in, in, in Rn minus 1. Right? So, so it's not just locally finite. It's actually also very rigid from all this. That's a good question. Uh, not my sense, I didn't make that up, but, but if you just rip holes in it, right, then, then the boundary, the space you have left over doesn't have non-negative Ricci, right? Yeah? Yeah. So no, one gets by Lipschitz away from a set of measure zero here. Uh, sorry, away from a set of small content here. But it's just, just going to be rectifiable in the end. Now, you, you don't have better than that. In fact, the, the, the proof of the homeomorphism structure doesn't even go through a Reifenberg. Now, there's, there's actually a different proof for this that, you know, if I was talking for another hour, apparently I would have gotten to. Now, that, that is more in line with how you want to argue here. But yeah, no, there's not better than by Holder on this at the moment. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, so I would have to recollect my memory better for that. So the conjecture is written in some paper with Toby, I think, originally. And whenever that was written, it was thought about very carefully. So, so if it's written as three there, I'm going to say no, and there was an example of four. Um, but I don't remember offhand. I have to think about it for a few minutes. Maybe like cones over lens spaces or something would be something I'd be worried about. No more questions. Uh, let's thank uh, Aaron again. Thank you.